when you're doing the comparison of the figures, if you were including Sky in those figures as well? So, yeah, so, um, th those were mostly, uh, that was ITV data. Um, and I'll now be contradicted by the guy who's collecting it. Sam, did that include Sky or was that just ITV? No, you're right, it's just ITV. I knew I was right. So, so you could so argue that... The Sky, the Sky figure won't increase it by that much because there was... Two million yeah, in the UK. Two million. So it goes from 10 to 12 and a half, yeah. versus about 13 episodes. Yeah. Pretty decent. Yeah. But also the, that's the 13 and a half also doesn't include, at the moment doesn't include, I think it was 370,000 on the um, ITV plus one for the talent sure. show. So. You can. Oh, you're a sports fan, right? Oh, yeah, I watch it. Okay. I'm glad we cleared that up. Anyway. No, no, no. <laughs> no, no other data questions for goodness' sake. <laughs> Let's talk about the insights. Well, let's start with, in terms of insights. Let's start there. It was a fascinating look at two events across the same uh, the, the, the same weekend, and two very different forms of uh, engagement. Or are they? When we talk about sport, and let's talk about football primarily here, that was, uh, that was the example. Is there a difference in the quality of engagement and the quality of the relationship between a fan and the football team and a member of an audience and a TV show that is actually worth more than the simple, the, the yeah, simple numbers? Yeah. I mean, it's not a private conversation, but I know you're a Southampton fan. You yeah. care what the hell happens yeah. to that football club. I do with... I've just lost uh, the audience. I do, <laughs> I, 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 I do with mine. What I'm suggesting is that it's a, it's a deeper kind of engagement and that smart brands can use that in different ways. I, th I think the, the challenge for any brand or anybody advising a brand is to really, really understand your consumer with all your business-to-business -business target forever. And believe me, for a, for a 15-year-old girl, what happens in the X Factor final is as important to a 35-year-old maybe even a Mancunian who might support Manchester United, or, an F, or F, uh, someone who's in the Tifosi for Ferrari versus someone who is absolutely addicted to Coronation Street and is a 55-year-old housewife. To them, it's their passion. So the challenge <coughs> for the brand is to understand that passion, respect it, and then, if you like, build a relationship and then get them produce either compelling, engaging content, which that person then, you're adding value to that relationship. <coughs> the, the pitfall to fall into is to, to kind of go for a vanilla approach, where you just say, we understand football fans across Europe, so here's our message to football fans across Europe. And it's not nuanced. So you have a, a generic campaign. Now sometimes you might, you might need, as you were saying, have a consistency in your strategy, but local messaging, especially online, is so much more important than it's ever been because it's so much more impactful and effective. Yeah. So that's a and, it, and again, the answer is uh, you know in, indicative, I think, of where those who actually work in sponsorship feel sponsorship is at the moment. You know, in my introduction, I sort of very flippantly talked about you know twenty odd years ago where we were with sponsorship, which was you know flogging booze and fags by sticking labels on the side of cars and around football grounds more or. Uh, more or less, but does the... Does That's the what I was doing 20 years ago, it wasn't just sticking yeah, you, you've grown I up. mean, it's a very... <laughs> <laughs> hang on a bit. Can't I get its investment in the Premiership? It was the highly sophisticated marketing campaign, both B2C and B2B, I'll have it. Yeah. Sticking stickers on the side of... Some... You, know what it, you know what it was, I wasn't trying to dish you, I was just lying, I was just lying about my age, it was yeah, 35 exactly. years ago. Yeah, right. <laughs> okay. But do you think, I think it's true that the sector has, has grown up, but do you feel that... Uh, Julie, perhaps we can start with you here, that, that sponsorship and sports marketing is well enough understood within the advertising and uh, marketing sector. Does it get the mind space that those of us who are perhaps more closely connected, even just as observers, believe that it uh, warrants now? Um, do you know, I still think that um, in, it, just looking at sports marketing, and I, I suppose I know the perspective more of the, the actual brands and the, and the clubs, that they are so different in terms of their sophistication and therefore what they're looking for from the sponsor or an agent who's helping them is very different. So I still think that you, know, you have got the very, very sophisticated end in terms of you know, some of the really big brands who have you know, incredibly big um, professional teams and they know what they, they're very clear about what they're trying to achieve and so their relationship with their sponsor is, is, you know, is, is, really, uh, is very much partnership 
and they know what they're trying to achieve. Whereas, to be honest, at the other end, you know, there are still, I think, a lot of sports brands who are actually still looking for advertising boards where they just want somebody to stick a logo up and pay a bit of money for it, to be honest. So I think it is a very broad church. <laughs> I agree. I think... Um I think there are some brands, and perhaps, you know, I don't like the division between B2B and B2C. I think it's pretty old. I think it's yeah. B2P at the end, people. But uh, it is true that um, B2C uh, companies do have very clear objectives, and they tend to do a better job than the, the newcomers. I also um, think that uh, it is getting better in, in the market, mm -hmm. but I do think overall we tend to measure a little bit what I, what, what I said um, earlier on, which is we just tend to measure the same things, which is um, cost per thousand and the, the return on investment, and this is a little bit where we all get a bit more limited. But yes, I think the market is maturing, it's getting better. Okay, so you know, we've, there are still some, uh, some brands um, out there, and um, watch what I say here slightly, but I, some years ago I interviewed the marketing director of a major airline brand uh, for, uh, for Sport Business who outlined his strategy quite simply and he said it's all to do with branding, we've put a board up, if we fly there we just, we want our, uh, we, <coughs> we want our name, I, I'm sorry, I didn't quite, didn't quite get that. Now that's, that's become a kind, of, a kind of notorious story. Do, is that still at all typical of this, uh, of, of this sector? Do they get it in the boardrooms of uh, multinational corporations across the board now? Okay, now my experience, again, um, is getting better. But I tell you guys, every single year, twice, I have to confront the board and I have to explain the way we spend money. And I do have to peel the onion 10,000 times. Yes. And this is what we achieve, and this is what we achieve, and this is what we achieve. And okay, before I was joking about the fact that I never care about brand awareness and familiarity, I was like, of course I do care about this. And we do measure it, yeah? And this is something that we do need to demonstrate um, you know, to, to the board. They want to know how many employees attended, uh, what was the engagement of the employees. They wanted to know what happened with, with the the customers when they came, the leads, they do want a full report. And another thing they, they, um, they do now is they want to be engaged earlier on. So this idea, and I did actually experience it many, many years ago, which is you got um, you know, the CEO saying, well, I do like golf, let's do golf. And then we thought, okay, but are you sure we want to do golf? Yeah, let's do it. This has definitely changed. Yeah. That's I'd agree. I think there is increasing sophistication. I think the... Um I th interesting what you said earlier on, Julie, about some of the some of the clubs kind of getting their act together as well and having to sell that. I think that there's there's an opportunity for quite a seminal moment with a number of the Premier League and some of the bigger clubs and some of the bigger sports rights owners to really understand and increase the value, to look at their assets as something which can be properly traded rather than just it's a media buy through some boards and stuff. Really understand the full value of their assets, their players, their managers, and, and how those can play out, especially in social media and so on. Um, and pressure should come more, sponsors should put more pressure on the right service, mm -hmm. rather than just say, because uh, there's always a nervousness when you're, especially when you think you're in a competitive situation, you're about to secure a deal, that your competitor's gonna come in and buy it. So you maybe don't push as hard for the asset base, because you just want, you, you are, you know, you, you're, you're the car brand, you don't want right, you're Ford, you don't want to wear it. You know, so maybe you should push harder and harder and harder and get better assets on the table. Is I still think there are quite a few examples though, of, and, and maybe this goes back to some of my BRIC countries, so some of these emerging um, corporates who are, they just think in their minds, sport is going to be good, it's a way of you know, showing credibility, yeah. and actually you know, they're buying football clubs, they're sponsoring football clubs without really understanding oh. what they're buying. So, you know, to be honest, for every yes. great example um, of, a, of, a, of a corporate who's getting very sophisticated and really understanding what they're trying to achieve out of their um, sponsorship of, of uh, sport, I think there are some, still, there are people who are only just starting to understand what is, they want. Is that actually holding back the whole sector then in terms of its growing, growing sophistication? Because it... I would have imagined that the market would determine that uh, rights owners would have to be more responsive and more, uh, yes, yeah, simply more responsive to talk a little bit more to, to their, their customers until somebody from, not beat about the bush, from the Gulf comes along with a huge check and distorts everything, uh, every, everything Bombay. They're not doing much, much of a service, are they? I, th I think. Um 
Well, if they're bringing money into the marketplace, then they're, do, they're doing a service, I mean, keeping that marketplace buoyant. The other, I thought, thought one of Julie's charts, you know, when you showed the map of where the major deals were, mm. I think that's, that's a really interesting chart because, partly because it, it used to be a, a shorter list. It was the US and yeah. a few in Europe. US and a few big deals <laughs> yeah. in Western Europe, and then, but then the, the IPL coming and all these other yeah. deals coming. Actually, I think the, the quality of um, the types of, um, and it might be that they're just going in for blunt awareness reasons, a given company. Yep. AIG went on to Man United shirts, and yes, they talked about releasing a new insurance product. They never did. They judged it by the big number, which is eyeballs, and also they went from outside of the top 100 into, I think, number 47 uh, on the most respected brands list. Mm. From their point of view, quite bluntly, that was a quite a short war meeting, job done. And then, they, then, then they're out because they're then a, a brand that's kind of got a face and has visibility. They, didn't, they never fully leveraged it and really sort of immersed themselves. That's not why they went into it. So we're getting a sort of a, a split, it would seem, between those at the, at the top end of the market with lots of money to spend, go yeah. for an, an awareness buy. And I'd, I'd just like your thoughts on this. The, the opposite end of the market, would I be right in thinking that perhaps you have to be smarter, more creative, more innovative, and work harder to make sponsorship work if you're a smaller brand looking at different kinds of uh, sports and making whatever budget you have go a hell of a lot, uh, a lot further? I think there's still lots of opportunities out there. Yeah. I mean, I, I, but maybe you do need to be creative and actually need, but, but actually I do think there are a lot of opportunities because again, I think there are a lot of um, sports that are looking for uh, different sorts of opportunities or they can, off, they can offer something else, you know, and that's where I think the CSR agenda or, you know, I think there's lots of, you just need to be more imaginative perhaps with, with education or... or I agree with you. I think apart from football and Formula One, mm -hmm. which I think, and you correct me, is more or less 50% of the overall revenues, if no more. Um, the rest is just there, you know, for everybody just to come and try to do a very interesting combination of things. Yeah. And um, this is what perhaps um, needs a bit more focus. Um, it is a bias market, and this is where you can still go to the table and say, look, we're going to look into a CSR campaign with you guys because you are doing nothing about it. That's what we have done with the ATP, for example, right? So um, I think I 100% agree. And th there's a real advantage to working with a medium or small rights owner because a, they need you more as a partner, they need your money, you're more important to them. And they should be, they're not always up, but they should be more flexible in what you can do in that partnership. Whereas the, the, f the further up the food chain you go, the more restrictive the rights become because they've been sliced and diced and you're only got to, you've got to work in the salted snack category in Taiwan. And only with these the set number of players. What is also is happening, at least my experience when always looking for new deals and trying to negotiate, is that um, you beginning to feel that there is a new generation of folks working in these organizations. So from meeting yeah. the old folks that they only know how to present a contract and that's it. You know, this is the way we would do it. To actually new generations and they are more flexible, that they actually have business minds and they are actually very good in software skills, it's just totally different. So this is where you can actually co-create, there is capability now at the other end. In the past, to me, there was not. There were no marketing capabilities. Yeah, sure. And it was only about five years ago that we saw a rash of uh, brands, Red Bull is one that springs to mind, actually going out and creating, owning the, the assets, uh, owning the assets the, yeah. themselves. It was predicted at the time, you know, this is the way things are going. Seems to have uh, yeah. seems to have fallen off the big time. Why is that? I think it's because of the individual who runs Red Bull just has deep pockets and personal, and knew that that was a way to market a brand because it wasn't such a surprise when you looked at how they launched their brand, built their brand, it was off the back of mm. adrenaline fueled sports. The most adrenaline fueled sport could be argued Formula One, but the, I don't think there are many other brands that that would be the right mm. things to. I remember looking at when I was on the uh, on the client side about. Wouldn't it be better to own something rather than to sponsor it? There's, there's an upside, you got get control and you can have some of the upside in terms of you know, revenue back from some of the content that's distributed. The downside is, if for instance you are a beer company, you're not a sports company. So it's quite a tricky, you know, you're, you're entering into an ownership area where it's not your expertise. What you might be in, uh, an expert in is marketing to consumers and building brands. So you maybe have some shared revenue on that. Um, but I could see the hesitancy in boardrooms around 
the world. So I'm getting involved. So. I mean, Volvo did it with their own race, which yeah. they yeah. own as well. As and they, they actually had perfect product placement there. I personally loved what a Red Bull did, and I think yeah. it was uh, perfect for the brand. It did represent the brand attributes. It was good experience. They did actually own it, um, but it's tough. It's really tough because definitely it's not sustainable. Because um, again, when you buy a right for a sponsorship, you need to allocate at least double for activation. That's at least what my agency is telling me. What I don't, don't <laughs> double, right? Uh, you usually it's 1.32 to the one dollar. That's that's what we usually tend to spend. But if you actually own an event like that, you are actually talking the big, 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 and you are liable for everything. So if something goes wrong, you need to go to the board and say, actually, I cannot blame anybody. Yeah. You know, because I am responsible for everything. But, and I think what happened in that case was we hit uh, with the, the bubble exploded. You said that yes. in English, yeah. And this is where we all begin to freak out a little bit, and we tend to buy and negotiate what it was out there more than create our new things. Although, interesting in the entertainment sector, we're aware of um, I can't be indiscreet, aware of uh, brands who are sharing IP and therefore both investment and the return on that investment in the entertainment sector. Where again, you know, with between an artist and a, and a brand, where they're starting to um, share the ups and downs on that. So it is happening, but in a in a related sector. Sure. When you were uh, when you were looking at the ATP sponsorship, just picking up on that, was it? Did you come to sport, or did you did you get to a situation three months before you made your final decision where you had? Properties in other genre in the in, in the picture. How how close did you come to sponsoring Glastonbury or something? Yeah, no, actually, well, it was it's actually we are still doing it, right? So every time we meet at a tournament, we still think, okay, what can we do together? What else? What else? So this is always the the, the next question. So when we uh, start with ATP, we say, well, we want this, and they say, well. No, you cannot have it. Mercedes has got already that. I really wanted the Nets at the time. Mm. Um, and I know you're going to have it. Mercedes has got it. And so, okay, what, what, what can I have that will have a TV graphic element and something that will go with the tour? And they said, well, actually, uh, no, you cannot have anything because we don't have anything. I said, well, what are you going to do about it? I want to do business with you. Let's look. So um, at the time, what they did is they began to, we agreed on the kind of tournaments we were interested in, and they actually did the negotiations one by one with all the tournaments. And what we got mm -hmm. now is what they, <coughs> ATP, called the Rico <coughs> package, which is the Empire Turf. We've got the Hawkeye. We are the official sponsor of the Match Facts. We've got a couple of banners. We've got the Speedometer. And in the contract, which is a contract that um, we build every year, and we add new tournaments, and we are the first ones that will always um, determine whether they want these properties or not, if it makes okay. sense. Yeah. Yeah. So it didn't exist. They created for us, we created together. That's cool. We have a question yeah, or a I'm comment. Just gonna ask, uh, obviously, um, as, a, as a broadcaster, um, you talked a bit, we've talked about activation, um, and it's obviously something that's very um, key to Anne and myself when we're talking about you know, the properties that we have and we spent a lot of money on to buy and going to sponsors and saying, okay, how you actually can activate them um, beyond, you know, beyond sort of the on the ground and actually on a broadcast platform. Um, now, I mean, I think we've seen lots of improvements um, across the years um, and I really, it was more of a view of um, what to, is there any particular brands or particular broadcast holders that you think have done a good job or in going in the right direction of when you've got the sponsorships and the clients mm -hmm. of actually bringing that through um, on, you know, on broadcast platforms or <coughs> any sort of eyeball platform, um, whether it be online or, you know, or, or player or, or whatever else? Broadcasters have done a great job. All of them. Well, and I, 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 I love you all. <laughs> Look, I don't know if I remember some numbers. Uh, working for a previous company, uh, we used to sponsor um, uh, the European Tour Gold. Mm -hmm. So um, Sky Sports and CNN and the deal we had with them. So what we use advertising to activate, it did actually work for us at the time. If I had the money and I could do it again, I would love to spend it with you guys, with all of you. <laughs> oh, very smooth answer. <laughs> Can I just ask, Fred, what was the last deal that our agency in, in Eurosport worked on with you? What's the? Because that's the best. Obviously, <laughs> yeah. Castrol. That was fantastic. Castrol and, and Eurosport. Yeah, that was brilliant. No, the um, 
I think uh, in terms of broadcast, I think the way I in which... Do with us in Asia as well. And that was even better. It was fabulous. Uh, fabulous. Um, actually, cash from Asia, some of, the, I mean, some of the other deals have done are fantastic. But um, what Sky, what, the way in which Sky Sports have built the Premier League brand here in the UK, I think is the most phenomenal achievement by a broadcast. They, they were effectively the Premier League's marketing department for the first 10 years. Did a fantastic job. And in tandem with something I worked on with Carling, it wasn't a broadcast sponsor, but it was a partner of a range of Murdoch businesses. That I'd hold up that as a great example. Well, it's a relationship which hasn't always been us. There's the, the old story about the BBC broadcasting test matches from the Oval after Foster's uh, took over the sponsorship. And there was a great sign in front of the commentary position saying, remember, this is the Oval, not the Foster's Oval. And that seemed to be the prevailing attitude in the broadcast community for quite a long time. We have another another question or a point, Seth? Yeah, I've got a question. I know that, that we talk about the larger franchises and the small to medium franchises, but what kind of advice would you give to advertisers with emerging franchises? You know, so there are lots of new sports. I think, to, to give them credit, the Americans do it better than anybody. They can turn anything into a sport, hot dog eating, cheerleading, or whatever. <laughs> it's, and it's very easy to get things aired globally, very easy to get things on TV if you've got a sponsor behind it. So. You like the fact there's almost a limit, a limitless supply of emerging sports, and sponsors that are happy to bankroll the exposure on TV because <coughs> uh, it's quite easy. Yeah. Um, what advice would you give a sponsor when faced with a list of emerging sports? It's great. Uh, it's, a, it's a great question. John, yeah. are you going to go first? I'm happy to, happy to answer. Well, first of all, I thought you were going down. What, what advice would you give to the emer emerging sports when they yeah. approach the sponsor? No, the sponsor's advice and answer the other secondary. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Because whatever the advice you give to the sponsor is what that sport should be doing. Okay. Well, the advice, um, yeah, maybe, maybe if it's in the interest of the sport as well. But the advice, advice to the sponsor would be um, a bit like fully understand, truly appreciate the values of the company and the, uh, your own company, your own brand, and what you're seeking to communicate. Now, that, you don't advise a client; they, that's that's what they do. And, and as you did, work out systematically, rigorously. Well, are the values, this is just one criterion, there are many others, are the values of the sport, be it small, emerging, whatever, are, are they reflective and are they going to enhance what we're trying to communicate? If we've got other metrics like we need to build affinity, are we going to reach out and engage with our consumers? If it is about awareness, are enough people going to see it? If it's small, maybe what it might do is say, we're investing in the communities in which we, uh, we, we take part. Where our businesses operate, we're going to invest in small and emerging sports. And that might be a good CSR slash kind of community investment. So that might, that's one set of advice. The other thing I would say, though, although it is related, the advice to the rights owner is that they very, very rarely, we did a trawl of, sort of nearly um, 65 different rights owners and how they were selling themselves. And there were hardly any <coughs> that talked about the real benefit and the value to the potential sponsor. All they start off talking about is that we were founded in 1875. Five million people play our game. We're growing. Here's our board of directors. Here's some funny <coughs> pictures from the last few events. Never talk about what it might do for you, Mr. Rico. Mm. Very, very rare. And they always give you a tie at the end. What do we do with you? Always, you know, always throw it away. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's probably a lot of them. And it doesn't, it doesn't, because if you're fighting for the advertising or the, or the marketing or the sponsorship dollar against other, I, I would propose, more sophisticated sellers, broadcasters, other media owners, then you're going to lose out. That's why the small and medium sports sometimes do suffer, because their sell is quite poor. And even at the top of the market, some of the huge, huge sports brands, they're still very, they're way behind the curve in terms of because we see media owners selling to us, have done research into our consumer base. A rights owner would never do that. Not many. Although it, it is interesting, because I've got an example recently of, of a, a very established um, brand who's actually you know, really just trying to step back and think through you know, actually all the established um, properties we're currently sponsoring. You know, we've probably done all we're going to do with some of those. Let's have a think about some of these really emerging sports yeah. and, you know, and really actually, because that might help us you know, achieve some different objectives. I mean, it, it all comes down to really what, what, what they're trying to that? achieve. In, <laughs> 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 but, 
but at least they, well, they haven't decided yet, but at least they've really questioned it. And, and, you know, we had a long conversation about kind of, you know, which um, geographies are emerging in terms of sport, which, which sports are emerging, you know, which ones do we think are really going to take off? You know, so I think people are, brands can be open to completely new sports or, or emerging sports. So, that, I mean, that's the good news in a way. It's interesting because the, the, the new sports that we've seen over the last couple of years... Um, there are some out there, but the ones that seem to have the biggest budgets to throw at things, they, they, you know, I'm slightly bored by them. They tend to be short, short-sided versions, or t- um, time shortened at least, versions of established sports. Now cricket has done that uh, brilliantly. Open wheel motor racing, where the teams are actually take the names of football teams. Um, they just, they just seems to be a, the, in, the, in taking your point about the United States. But in Europe and other parts of the world, they, people don't seem to be very imaginative in what they're doing in that area at all. Or am I just reading the situation entirely wrong? Yes. Okay. <laughs> right, next question, please. And I, can I just say one thing? I'm actually um, failing in my moderating duty somewhat here. Will you ask a question? If you could just let us know who you, uh, who you are so we know to make a beeline from next time. I'm gonna come, there's a question over there, and we're going to come to the gentleman in uh, the middle. Can we start? It looks, I might do this for you. This looks like John Luff of Sustainable Marketing to me. <coughs> John Luff, founder of Sustainable Marketing. Um, so the thought I had, really, it's a thought rather than a question. Um, it's in your job titles, and when we look at compare and contrast, but the contrast is between sports and leisure and entertainment. And I'll explain the interest if anyone's interested. So the thing that compares to me is gaming and gambling. Because if you put up a chart that shows on any given night, and you amalgamate the X factor and everything else, if you'd have shown against the the comparison against lotteries or whatever, I think the millions would go through the roof if it's compared to that. And what I'm observing with the folks I've worked with is that it, it doesn't quite sit. Either some folks put gaming in with sports, because they're good with that, some people sit in with leisure, and it is exploding when you look at those bricks around the world. And in terms of how you then merge it in with, uh, with, with CSR and social media, it feels to me, if you look at minority sports versus gaming, I know where I would go in terms of an interesting area to have a look at. That was a thought rather than a question. So, are you, are you saying, just to be uh, clear, John, that, uh, are you, that the, um, if you looked at those events on, on Saturday night yeah. and added in all the people who were. Who, who clicked it, onto it, the equivalent of the lotteries, all for, well, we looked at Super Bowl. Mm-hmm. In the US, there are something like, I forget the exact one, there are something like 50 plus lotteries showed on a given night across Europe and so I just think it's, um, I, 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 you, you pause because of the moral consideration against this, but it just feels it's an area. If you're putting up compare and contrast contrast, we have sports and like, where does gaming and gambling sit in all of this? Because I think a lot of some of those comes out of the water. So a, a, a third sort of serious player to, con- to consider here. Thank um, just, um, let, let's have a little gamble, shall we? Because uh, I don't think it would blow those figures out of the water. Bet you're five. <laughs> <laughs> Can I get in the middle here somewhere? <laughs> <laughs> okay, that sounds like one that's going to continue over a glass of wine yeah, in, uh, in 20 minutes or so. Uh, gentleman over here. Uh, my name's Harry, I'm from IMG. Um, just want to ask, well, to what extent do you guys think the sportsmen players themselves are having an impact on advertising and sponsorship? And if so, is it a good thing? Because if you follow the tracks of someone like David Beckham, if you look at it, I'm not saying it's coincidental, but when he left Man United, they were a night product. He's obviously the face of Adidas. He moves to Real Madrid, Adidas. He moves to LA Galaxy, Adidas. He moves to AC Milan, Adidas. Yeah. So what power do you think the players got themselves? Can we add something to that as well? Because it's something that we discussed earlier, which is that we're looking at the, the marketing power of individual athletes. just wonder from the corp- elements of corporate safety, um, whether the influence of social media now, the gossipy nature of, uh, of Twitter, whether some of the dangers of being associated with an individual player have actually, or an individual athlete, you know, actually mitigates perhaps some of the, uh, the benefits. So perhaps when you're, when you're considering that, you could take that into account as uh, well. Juliet, start yeah. with you on that. Um, I mean, I think that, um, that generally speaking, um, there are obviously a few athletes who are, have huge value. But I personally, I think that's an area that you have to tread fairly carefully with in terms of sponsorship. 
because, the, I mean, it's not really just some of the reputational issues, but it's also the injuries. And, you know, I think if you, it, it, you're in much more danger of putting all your eggs in one basket. Now, clearly, there are some, you know, fantastic examples of very strong um, player brands. Um, but actually, it's a relatively small number. Um, so I, I think it's a relatively high risk. It can be high reward, but it's a high risk area of sponsorship in terms of sport, would be my I agree with you. I think uh, when it comes to the individual, um, that is always, I mean, we all love it, right? You, you can get personal. So you will have that affinity that perhaps a team wouldn't carry in the same way. But I also think um, the, 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 the um, reward and, and the, the opposite of that, the, it also depends on the sport. And if we think about what's happened with, what's the name of that little guy that plays football, um, the one that was in the press very lately. Yes, okay. You know, yeah, yeah, what actually happened, sorry, I'm sorry, I forgot what happened with that. You know, yeah, it was actually pretty bad. It was just all over social media, but you know what? We will move on because there is so much, you know, to choose in the world of football than who cares. But actually, what happened to Tiger, Tiger Woods, it was very, very different because the whole golf actually got damaged because golf was built around the figurehead, yeah. okay? And thank God, and I, I don't know, that's at least my, my opinion. I think tennis has already passed that level where, okay, so they happened with Nadal or Roger Federer, they are already kind of folks out there that will still keep tennis. You know, it's a very vibrant and clean, clean sport. Whereas cycling is going through yeah, a bad time yeah. as well, isn't it? Because of personalities. Well, it's funny, isn't it? Because you, you'd have thought, um, the high-risk strategy is normally to partner with individuals, and I know cert certain companies, and I've, I've worked at them, say so we, we don't sponsor individuals, we sponsor events or, or, or teams. Um, and you thought the safest bet would be to, uh, to be a partner of FIFA, as opposed to Wayne Rooney. Right? <laughs> How do you feel this week if you're you know, one of those FIFA partners? Think about it. You, you might not be able to walk away even if you wanted to. And, and actually the pra pragmatic members around that boardroom table would probably suggest, uh, like if you're on Coca-Cola, um, this might be a bit of an uncomfortable ride. We've got to put out a statement mm -hmm. that says, we hope, and notice, none of them said we threatened to pull out. They all said, um, we, we trust in FIFA to sort this out. I mean, it's uncomfortable, it's, it's distressing, it's damaging. But I think what they're really sponsoring Wait to is see the World if Cup. Ever Correct. So they're, they're really sponsoring the World Cup, not FIFA, though, aren't yeah. they? So well, yeah, but you, well, you say that, but in the minds of the consumer, they now, FIFA has now become a more visible brand than ever before. True. And if you are a corporate partner of the World Cup or FIFA, in the consumer's mind, you're, they'll see, as, because they started reading in the paper, there's a logo next to Blatter. It used to be next to the players. I think, I think they will start, I think what will happen is the storm could blow over. Mm -hmm. But if it keeps going and keeps going raging, maybe someone might exit. I think, sorry, I've got a different think, view on that. I think, I think it's very short term. Give it a couple of months. Coca-Cola will still sponsor it. We'll That's be paying the money. And I tell you, if Coca-Cola dropped it, Pepsi is from Cola away. Yeah. And you have to look at the fashion industry. What's happened with that woman? Uh, again, I forgot all the names. Uh, Moss. Yeah. In a week, she lost, I don't know how many contracts. I think she's got them all back. Yeah. You know, it's just double the price. Yeah. And this morning I was taking the, the, the bus and again, that other model that was throwing whatever at the, the maid, um, forgot her name, okay? And again, she's the face of Dolce Gabbana. So anyway, you know, me Campbell, I thought, how do these people do it? What have I done wrong with my career? Because if I do that, I'll be done, right? Yeah. To these people, so I think it's, you know, they forget. And the public did with the International Olympic Committee after, after Salt Lake. They were able yeah. to put yeah. some clear blue water between the, 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 the governing body. I and think the, the other thing is, I think most of those corporations are really quite thick-skinned. You know, it's only if, the only reason that, that, for instance, Pepsi pulled out of the deal with Madonna, I believe, because it was it like a, like a prayer video, because there were a whole load of complaints from the kind of the, the, you know, the Bible Belt, and they felt maybe they wanted to pull out of the deal anyway, and that just yeah. provided the trigger. Yeah. If, you want to, if you want to ride out the storm and stick with it, you will. And I think that's the problem with Tiger Woods. Woods he's, he's, he's lost all his confidence playing golf, and that's why he's no longer yeah. attractive. Yeah. In terms well, of yeah, some partners pulled out. Yes, no, but they, yeah. they did immediately. But actually, if he could still play golf, I think he'd have got them all back again. But actually, he's yeah, assuming he's on yeah. his yeah, he's, he's on his way back. <laughs> um, they're making signs at me from the uh, from the back of the room, uh, <laughs> which I think means that uh, we're all out of uh, time, guys. <laughs>